All right, good morning, everyone. You're looking at the organizing committee here. Um, the four on that end are the ones that got John and I in trouble for sponsoring this. Um, I'm sorry that our facility is not a beautiful marble palace in Rome, <laughs> but um, I, I hope uh, everyone's having a good time. So uh, we're just going to throw out some clinical issues, problems, if you will. Um, and we've all done a lot of ablations for accessory pathways. I mean, that's a lot of what we do. It makes up a big percentage of our ablation volume. And sometimes where you see a pathway in the left free wall, it's like, okay, let's just get this done. The fellow can do the case, that kind of thing. Every now and then, it, uh, or maybe not every now and then, a lot of the time, it's in the posteroceptal space, which I still find very, very challenging. Um, you, you map with your coronary sinus catheter and you see something that's right at the mouth of the coronary sinus. Maybe there's a diverticulum right there. Maybe there's a middle cardiac vein that you put a catheter down and the signal looks very tempting. I just want to query the, the panel and audience is allowed to uh, participate when, when we're done with these characters. Um, uh, what is your approach to a case like that? So perhaps a little idiosyncratic, um, but um, first thing is um, pretty much always use a coronary sinus catheter with a lumen um, from above. And um, if I'm dealing with um, either avian node reentry or anything that looks like a post receptal pathway, I'll do a contrast injection in LAO RAO to outline the anatomy, figure out where the coronary sinus os is. And rule out a diverticulum, which is a very fast way of ruling out a diverticulum. Um, that sort of tells you also the relationship of your electrode pairs to the mouth of the coronary sinus, and that's sort of helpful. Um, and then, you know, I guess we start on the right, and, um, you know, at some point we don't get, um, you know, success, and, we, and you move to the left, really. And I guess, you know, for me, the, um, the approach to left-sided pathways I've always felt pretty strongly that you need to have both tools in the toolbox, retrograde and antegrade. Um, and for post-receptal pathways, there's two types of pathways that I think are, at least in my hands, are much easier done by retrograde approach. The first would be a uh, you know, true left posterior paraseptal pathway. It's right up in that like corner, uh, just a centimeter into the coronary sinus os, which is hard to get to, I think, by transeptal to come all the way back. But with a retrograde approach, it goes very, there very, very nicely. The second one, which is something that Michael Lesh taught me about many, many years ago is this so-called left intermediate septal pathway, which is sort of on the septum but on the left side. And, and I don't know that it makes all that much anatomic sense, but I guess when I've encountered these, what happens is, you know, you're doing your ablation, you're, uh, you know, you're getting transient success just a little bit superior to the mouth of the coronary sinus. You know, it's going away, coming back, going away, coming back, going away, coming back. Um, in that situation, I go immediately go retrograde flip it across the valve, okay, um, or actually on either side of the valve, frankly, but just a centimeter above the coronary sinus, os, um, typically in LAO, and I've had a lot of success there. So that's my approach. But I, but I think f the main message for me is, you know, I started doing left-sided ablations retrograde, learned how to do transeptal. I think that both tools should be in your, in your tool toolbox. So I didn't work this subject, but <laughs> I can say something about that. So. Normally, uh, first of all, I didn't do, I don't do the coronary sinus angiogram. Uh, I look uh, first uh, if there's a preg station. Uh, I pace from the high right atrium and then to look for the maximal preg station and then to know uh, the place of the accessor pathway and some, and then uh, after then I induce the tachycardia. Sometimes the retrograde pathway is somewhat different from the antegrade approach, and then uh, sometimes mismatch, and then in different way. So the, uh, for after then, if I have, if I would have problems uh, to find a good point during uh, from the right side or left side uh, mapping, then uh, I will go to make a uh, coronary sinus angiogram if there are any uh, diverticulum or uh, something like that. Uh, normally, uh, in the right side of the uh, coronary sinus uh, ostium or something like that, I prefer to do cryoablation as an energy, but in the left side, in the left posterior septal 
uh, area, I would like to use the, the mostly radio frequency ablation. I, you know, I'd like to second George's comment about doing using a lumen coronary sinus catheter. Um, I think the Boston folks should do that and train their fellows to do that because your fellows become our staff. <laughs> 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 anyway, so, but the problem is those catheters um, aren't being offered anymore. And so we've squirreled away a few. But uh, for those of us like, like you and I, George, that do that, uh, what are we going to do when those catheter, when we run out of those catheters? Do you have an alternate catheter? in Geneva. Um, so y there are a couple on the market that you can use. Some have an inner and an outer. The outer has a lumen that you can inject through, and then there's an inner with a, with a micro octa pole that you can thread through. So, so there are a couple of options. Molly always remembers the name. I forget the name. Yeah, it's uh, called EP Star, and uh, Bayless makes it. So just a uh, fun fact, I mean, I, I started doing this when I, in 1988 when I was an adult EP fellow when we were doing DC ablations of postreceptral pathways, and the protocol then was to use your catheter with a lumen, and if it was a postreceptral pathway, you did your injection so that you could put, uh, straddle the coronary sinus acid with a proximal pair, um, and then you <laughs> delivered your 200 joules of DC energy directly to that <laughs> pair. That's where I started doing it. I just never stopped, basically. Okay. All right. Our approach, maybe I'm a bit the bad guy now, or the bad, uh, how do you say that, woman? Because we have to talk about energy forms again. So um, first look is on the ECG. If the ECG is negative in 3 and AVF, but a little bit positive in lead 2 and has a septal pattern in the chest leads, I'm kind of relaxed because this is a pathway, I guess, that is endocardial around the mouth of the coronary sinus, and we can ablate it there. If I see a broad pre-excitation in 2, 3 AVF, this calls for trouble. So um, this is with a high percentage in epicardial pathways. So we are doing the coronary angio, uh, no, sorry, not the coronary angio, the CS angio as well, because we want to see, as you said, anatomy. We want to look for a diverticular or for a large middle cardiac vein. Then we start mapping, and if it turns out it is a pathway where we have to ablate in the middle cardiac vein or at the neck of the diverticulum, um, we switch, especially in the older children, or we use irrigated tip ablation. And this is my background. I was trained with the adults, and um, the adults love it. Um, the idea is not to create a superficial lesion, uh, but you need to have a transmural lesion. So with this, we were able, we started that, I think, 10 or 12 years ago. And with that, we cut down our recurrence rate, I would say, in the postreceptal region from 15 to maybe 5%. I know, I mean, there was this discussion yesterday about coronary um, problems. In the 17 years in Munich, we've had one case um, just recently, some weeks ago first case in, in 17 years. We're not uh, routinely performing coronary angios. So this was a boy, f um, 45 kilos, post pathway one, um, irrigated tip, um, 30 watt, um, um, uh, how do you say, one, one shot. And one hour later, he had chest pain, and for an hour, he had elevated ST segment. Then everything returned to normal. And I was impressed on the MRI we did. I mean, we had created quite a transmural lesion, and he had a very, very distal occlusion of the, of the posterior what lateral branch. Uh, I don't remember that one. There was one. I, yeah. I mean, you should always look. I mean, this is a very decisive thing. Yeah, no, because we always right. look, and, right. and if we get more than 15 ohms, right. we're afraid that we're using too much energy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but this, coming back to that, this is the only case I know. And um, I think it's always this risk-benefit discussion because if you look into coronary uh, angio um, complications, one point, uh, I think 0.1 percent in the literature in the adult or 0.2 even. Uh, I, I give it to you. 
and uh, versus versus um, problems with irrigated tips. So I think this is an ongoing discussion, but in my eyes, for, for older children, this is an energy form I really love and that cut down. Have you done coronary angiography? No. We've never done coronary angiography. I think that the, the, the risk, we may under-report and under-recognize coronary um, problems, but the question is what, what, what's the consequence or what, is the, what, what comes out of it? No, we're not doing it routinely. And this one case will not change our, our uh, work. Okay. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, in the end, in this, in this boy, we didn't do anything with the coronary artery because uh, uh, it was very distal and what would you do then? And if, even if you see then maybe, because you talk of underreporting, even if you see maybe an edema or something because you ablated there and the surroundings normally it will go away. And, and so what's the clinical consequence of that coronary artery, let's say, irritation? None. Yeah. So it's, it, I think it's a difficult question, but when we ablate, uh, for example, in, in atrial fibrillation, we end often we end up in the coronary sinus uh, even more distally because we want to ablate uh, fractionated electrograms or whatever. Um, and we don't do routinely coronary artery injections because we, um, with all this experience, we esteem that the, that the risk of, of having a dissection or anything in adults at least uh, on the coronary arteries is higher than the, than the, the profit uh, of, of doing this. And uh, the second thing is that um, um, almost everybody in the adult world uses for these ablations in the CS irrigated tip. There is no discussion about that because it has a lot of um, advantages. Uh, you don't have these impedance problems with the irrigated tip. Um, you don't create a superficial burning, but you really create a deeper lesion. And um, you don't have the problem of stenosis, at least not as much as with a non-irrigated tip. Yeah. So Behind you, Frank. You know, just one approach that I've started taking is during every case now, we do an impedance map. And it turns out that the coronary sinus impedance is very distinctly different. And you get a, a beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, map of the impedance. And if you get into, a, you know, a diverticulum or a coronary vein, the impedance changes. So if you're following impedance mm -hmm. as you're doing this, it, it, it helps and it helps you decide, you know, because, you know, I guess we're, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to ablate in the coronary sinus. I mean, I, I just I just feel like if it's in the coronary sinus, then you're probably going to need to go to the left side. But right. um, but the impedance map really helps. This is one thing I also wanted to, to point out. If you don't have a diverticulum and you don't have a, a, a big uh, middle cardiac vein where you want to ablate, go to the left side. You don't want to ablate CS56 uh, earliest activation from the right side. Don't do that. Go to the left side. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in my uh, practice, I usually start with the regular RF catheters uh, for the ablation. And if, I mean, the accessory pathway function recurs immediately after the energy, then I switch to the uh, irrigated tip catheters. Uh, and sometimes if I ha have a small baby and uh, the accessory pathway is in the reachable place with the cryo ablation catheters, and then I would like to try cryo catheters also to to be on the safe side. Uh, that's that's my approach. I can say. Well, I I have a confession to make. Um, when we first started ablating in that area, we didn't we didn't think about consequences. We thought about getting rid of the pathway, and it was many a year when we didn't worry about coronary issues and never observed one. And then uh, I had a case, uh, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, that was sent to me from another hospital where they had already ablated there and I figured, well, I'm going to take a coronary picture beforehand because they did like 50 lesions around the mouth coronary sinus and, and the coronary was clean as a whistle. Um, it was the right dominant system as most are. So um, I figured we would go ahead and do the procedure our way, and I actually found the middle <laughs> cardiac vein, and that's where, that's where the problem was. And I superimposed 
the angiogram, the, the coronary angiogram, on top of where I was about to ablate, and it was a millimeter away. And that was around the time that Sonny Jackman was starting to show his angiograms of coronary injury. It was right when cryo came out, and he was advocating switching to cryo. We had a cryo unit at the time. I used it. Nothing happened. So I went back to RF and ablated, and I took another coronary picture afterwards. No EKG changes, nothing changed with the patient, but that um, pretty significant branch off the right coronary that went to the medial base of the, L of the LV was uh, completely occluded. And we um, called uh, our colleague from Brigham and Women's Hospital who uh, would come over with some coronary interventions for us and he opened it up, didn't, didn't have to stent it. Now, whether that was edema, spasm, or actually frying the coronary, I don't know. But ever since then, I've taken angiograms uh, before and after ablation in that area if I'm around the mouth of coronary sinus. And if it's too close, you know, I follow the, the instructions that Sonny Jackman has talked about where if you're five millimeters away, you're fine. If you're less than three millimeters away, use cryo. And if you're three to five, you know, look at it in clinical context and, and take your chances. But we always try alternate methods before we actually ablate in the coronary venous system, um, particularly the, the left-sided approach. Because most of these pathways go atrial side uh, on, on the right towards ventricular side, I'm sorry, ventricular side on the right towards atrial side on the left. And uh, you can attack either, either spot. Um, but uh, it, it's still a challenge. I still find it very challenging. I'd like to, uh, in the spirit of audience participation, uh, of those of us who are routinely doing ablations in kids, and I suspect that's most of the people in this room, uh, how many of us are routinely, routinely doing coronary angiography in association with ablations in the posterior septal space? And, and how many of us might consider changing our practice based on uh, the type of stuff that we're learning, for instance, from Thomas' presentation, Thomas Paul's presentation last night? Yeah, I think so too. You know, I, I, I um, uh, Ed and I work in the same place. We have. I don't. I don't need to repeat our experience. But uh, I, I, I personally think that the cost of doing coronary angiography is not trivial, especially in the smaller kids where it's likely to be more necessary and important to do so. Uh, and it would be a great target for technical innovation in our field uh, to think of another way that we could monitor coronary perfusion uh, during, um, uh, during ablation in real time uh, that would uh, make this perhaps less of uh, um, an unpleasant choice that we have to make uh, between extending our procedures and increasing the risk, the procedural risk to the patient versus potentially missing a silent but important uh, aspect of ablation, which you know we might not see the consequences of at the time of the procedure itself, but the patient may suffer from you know 10, 20, 30 years later. I'm going to push back a little bit. Um, so we've been doing catheter ablation for how long? 30 years, longer than that. Where are the patients who have coronary insufficiency due to all of the crazy things we did back in the early 90s? I don't, haven't seen them. Um, in the adult world, and I have adult cardiologists here, tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm saying this right, an asymptomatic patient with a significant you know, stenosis doesn't routinely get, at least in most parts of the world, doesn't really routinely get PTCA, right? I mean, they're asymptomatic, they've got a stenosis. We know that MIs mainly happen due to plaque rupture rather than these areas of stenosis. And my concern about starting to do a lot of coronary angiography is we're going to find stuff. And once we've found stuff, we're going to do stuff about it. And I think, that, and so there is expense to doing coronary angiography, but then you go down that rabbit hole, I think there's significant 
concern about doing stuff to patients that they don't actually need. Um, I would agree to that. And I mean, we heard you yesterday, Susan, telling us we should ablate them all. And I mean, um, 80% of asymptomatic WPW is in the post-receptor region in our experience. So this is not something rare. I don't know if people agree, but so what are you doing if, if, if you can't ablate all those pathways? What's, what's the consequence then? We got one more comment on this topic and then we'll, we'll try and come up with another topic. I think comments deserve more. Well, wait a sec. No, we have we have a comment about uh, on on deck right here. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so I think everyone agrees that a coronary sinus catheter is imperative for pathways in this location. Um, if you can't get it from below and you can't get it from above, if you have a, bat, if a significant Debesian valve, which happened to me once, then what do you do in that scenario? Uh, you, you make it up as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so for those of you who haven't tried it, I would strongly recommend it because it's a catheter in catheter. So um, the outside catheter is six French and you can align it to the Theresian valve and then you can usually get the two French catheter across. All right, so we've established that our representative from the FDA is in favor of causing coronary stenosis. I think that's a good <laughs> conclusion to this topic. <laughs> um, I have two alternatives. I'll ask for a show of hands. We can talk about management of CPVT, or we can talk about managing the explosion of home telemetry. Um, CPVT, hands up. Uh, we'll go with we'll go with CPVT. <laughs> uh, patients with poorly controlled CPVT, you've put them on natalol, maxed them out, maybe tried a little bit of flecainide. Where do you go next, and when do we start to intervene by referring them to surgery or to the pacemaker lab? Anybody want to take a quick stab at that? That position, I think, uh, uh, left cardiac sympathectomy for, for the patients, mm, it might be useful. Because, uh, you know, after the publication of the Arthur Wilda, uh, we know that the ICD implementation in such cases uh, does not any effect on the survival of the patients. So. Cardiac sympathetic innovation might be important. I mean, the first step of these patients. I, I think um, from from the medical standpoint, flecainide was a big game changer, and I would say that uh, that in our experience, at least, um, most of uh, the patients respond to flecainide. I'm not sure about the beta blocker, but I would probably put them all on flecainide right away, and that's what we're doing. And then I think the question is, what are you going to tolerate on the exercise test? Um, and when do you really get, get afraid? Uh, and I, I, my reference is always Arthur Wilde also, and, and, and I talk to him, so maybe Nico also wants to comment on that. What do you tolerate on the exercise test? Because I'm tolerating it by Geminus. If it's a couplet, okay. If it's VT, I don't know. But. Um, I think this is a decisive question. Do we really have to go further than flecainide? And, and I must say at our center, we've never had to do a sympathectomy, and we were very reluctant uh, putting an ICD in, but we did never encounter a, a sudden death um, uh, in people on flecainide. I don't know, what do you think? Um, we have some cases where flecainide and, and, and beta blockers do not, uh, are not effective enough, so that happens, of course, if you, you have these severe cases, and then we go on to a selectomy, actually. Mm -hmm. We do accept sometimes some ectopy, of course, on the exercise test, so, but if it becomes, uh, well, very what dirty. What do you accept? <coughs> what, what's your yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, that's difficult to say because we, you, we have also uh, tested repeated exercise tests, mm -hmm. which 
so that can be quite different in, in the same patient. So, but we accept some some uh, ectopies, uh, and if there are runs or or uh, if it's very frequent, then we go on to stelectomy for sure. Yeah. You know, if I can add, we have a couple of patients who we identified with CPVT a long time ago before we really understood how bad it could be for those folks to have ICDs implanted. And one of the interesting aspects of that is you get to see from the telemetry monitoring aspects of the ICD what their day-to-day -day rhythm actually looks like. Uh, and, and one of the most perplexing problems I have are with patients who have very good control of their ventricular arrhythmias using beta blocker and, um, um, and flecainide, but who have extremely frequent and sometimes quite scary looking atrial arrhythmias. So much so that we've even sometimes speculated that we should maybe be thinking about ablative options, although we've never gone there, they're, they're, the, the atrial arrhythmia is so ominously persistent that it feels like somehow we're not treating the disease. And yet, uh, the couple of patients that I'm thinking of in this particular unusual situation, I follow now for decades without clinical event. Um, <clears throat> I agree that, that sometimes the atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia, even we have some cases with ICDs in the past that where you can see actually it's, well, the, it starts with atrial fibrillation and then, then uh, the patient get a shock and then VF and VT. So that's the, also the downside, I think, of an ICD. But you have this monitoring that it starts with, often that it can start with atrial fibrillation. Um, I think there are some cases that you should consider also ICD. I know Arthur is very against. And if you have this bidirectional VT, it doesn't work. But we all know that. But sometimes you have patients who have VF uh, with CPVT and it's still, I think, there is still a, a place for ICD even in CPVT. I know if Arthur is here, he's probably, <laughs> his opinion is different, but I, I, I think there still is a place for, you should do your stalactomy first, and, 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 but sometimes there is an indication to, to give an ICD. I think Andres has a comment or a question. Just in terms of the sympatectomy, so, <coughs> so our approach is that we start also with beta blocker and flecainide in every symptomatic patient, um, but we offer usually sympatectomy in most patients once they reach puberty, independent of their symptoms or, in, well, you know, if you have proper SCPVT, of course, not if you're just a gene carrier, because we learned that, unfortunately, in puberty, um, the so, so far well working medication stops working because they stop taking it often. So, so we see that um, as a more as an insurance in addition to the medication. I think the likelihood of forgetting your medication becomes higher the older you are. Um, and we've seen a lot of patients actually dying uh, once they go from uh, pediatric to adult care because uh, then the guidance is less and they're they forget their medications more and they're taking more other things. So, so their that's mom's not reminding them yes. to take their medication yes. every day. <laughs> so, and I think that's, that's important because you, you know, you, you bring them all the way to 18 and then they die suddenly. So I think that's a, that's a strong indicator for, for sympatectomy in those. And otherwise we go also with Arthur Wilde. So we only put an ICD in when everything else fails. And I would rather probably uh, accept some ectopy um, on the other hand, I have a patient who has an ICD and because we didn't know at that time we put in the ICD that it was CPVT because he presented with heart failure and atrial tachycardias, which were not ablatable, by the way, so don't even try much. <laughs> and, and he's doing okay with the ICD because he also has a sympatectomy well medication. So. Christina has a question or comment, and also I'm looking around the room to see if Charlie rule yeah. is here this morning yet. I, I, he's the, the person I think who has written, who has, who has most systematically analyzed the data as far as the efficacy. Uh, am, I, am I correct in that? Or maybe I, there's even a co-author here. I did it. That, yeah. it, was <laughs> us. it was us, actually. Okay. Right? No, Perfect. was it Joe? I know Perfect. Joe's on it. I'm on it. Um, 
Yeah, so that's the efficacy of, is that your question? Is yeah, efficacy, efficacy it, of right, sympathectomy, oh, bilateral, no, unilateral. It. Mine was on the shock. And, and specific to CPBT, so Christina. No, I just wanted to make one comment, um, and I agree with, I'm sorry I came in late, but um, I agree with all of these comments. And one of the things that I found useful for my patients, um, the teenagers, so I wait until once they become teenagers and I get concerned about compliance, what I've done is I've put in a loop recorder. And then if I ever see a PVCs and I say, you know, I call them up, I say, this is, and I granted, I know that it could be, a, you know, it could be you're recording their death. But if I see any PVCs, I see anything, we actually have a talk. I say, you're not taking your medicine. And I've used it as a way to keep track and give them. And, and then we talk about, you're going to have to, you know, either we're getting a sympathectomy or we do this. But it's a way for me to track them. I don't know if it's right or wrong. But I absolutely agree with the compliance is a problem. And it was the only way that I didn't, you know, I could make sure they were taking medicines. Can, can I just sort of comment about the loop records? We do a lot of ILRs in, um, in our um, channelopathy patients. And, and part of the reason is, um, I suppose compliance, but the main reason is teenagers faint for lots of reasons. And you know, if you've got a patient who's being treated and they, they faint, you kind of need to know why they fainted. You know, is it, do you need to you know, ex um, step up your therapy, or is it something else? And so that we, we do a fair amount of that. Um, just to comment, a bunch of years ago, there was a session like this that was dealing with, you know, causes of sudden death, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT, CPDVT, and Jeff Tobin stood up and said, you know, every single disease that you talked about here, we can cure with heart transplant. And <laughs> Everyone laughed, you know, but um, he was right, and um, you know, so uh, you know, the question is, uh, has anyone ever had had to transplant one of these patients? Because it is actually an indication if, if you're failing all medical management, you know. No, we have. Oh, go ahead. It wasn't a failure of medical management. It was a specific variant, and the patient actually had he presented with atrial arrhythmias. So I think the CPVT initially got missed. He has developmental delay, so he's, I don't know, Arthur's here. We've talked about this neurodevelopmental delay, this spectrum of the CPVT, but he had such, he had such bad failure and then arrested in the bathroom um, in our hospital and ended up um, getting a transplant, and the explanted heart has every sign of ARVD. But his, his clinicals, he still had the VT and the atrial tac, so I think this was more on the typical but severe failure that led to transplant. We have a question or comment from Mac Dick. Yeah, well, we had one patient who had a transplant. She was, <coughs> she presented a long time ago, shortly, not long after I got to Michigan. So it was in, um, in the early 80s in uh, uh, and <coughs> Fred Marotti come look and everybody to look and we gave her beta blockers. We thought it was long QT with normal QT type of thing, you know, was when we were confused. But like you said, we didn't recognize the diagnosis. Uh, she uh, had repeated, uh, repeated uh, uh, episodes. She, uh, I sent her to Arthur Moss to do the uh, sympathectomy, left sympathectomy. Not uh, he thought she had long QT syndrome for it too. Also, uh, didn't seem to do much, um, and they were experts at it. And then we. Uh, uh, she continued, then I put an ICD in her, and it was the days there were the patches that looked like uh, toaster, you know, things you put around the heart. Well, that caused uh, uh, chronic pericarditis and constriction. Uh, she uh, continued to have, uh, she had a storm one night with, a, you know, pacemaker, I mean, ICD, a, a arrhythmia storm. Uh, I remember that vividly. The fellows didn't have a clue what to do. And, uh, uh, and then uh, eventually I, 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 she, had a, she had a transplant. She's had no uh, arrhythmia since, as we've cured the symptoms. Uh, symptom. She had severe post-traumatic uh, disease following the, all this continued uh, output of uh, her arrhythmia. Uh, but she's doing well. She went to finish college. She's an odd little girl, but she's now 30, 35 or something. And I just got a text from her showing me she got a new dog. 
with a picture if you want to see it. All right. Have we exhausted this subject? I would, I would oh, just... We've got one more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, say many of those patients um, have underlying bradycardia. And um, with medications, the bradycardia gets even worse. Now, I'm not worried about symptoms during bradycardia, but one of my patients had a sympathectomy and uh, coded actually during induction. This patient ended up not having sympathectomy at that time and not having an ICD or pacemaker. Um, uh, it was done the other time. So that is one thing that we all have to deal and then sometimes, you know, for the severe bradycardia, because of the bradycardia, they are not compliant with medications besides everything else. There are different genotypes. Also the exercise test that we do, I remember the excellent presentation that Prince uh, has given about the way we perform exercise tests on those patients. I do not know how many of you use the regular bruise versus the uh, exercise with the maximum intensity at the beginning. And I think that I have been doing this for the couple of years, and I think that makes a difference to actually induce the, see the, the real uh, medication effect in those patients. Most of my patients are exercising and continue doing this. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I think we could go on on this topic for a long time, actually. I, I have a couple of fairly simple questions and uh, comments to maybe get people's opinions on. Um, and I really love the idea of ILR for compliance and putting it in all of them. Um, one, one issue, one simple issue is, you know, I think w it needs to be a little bit more than a little bit of flecainide. And, um, and um, you know, w I have a recent patient and the question arose to me, you know, is BID flecainide enough for all these children? Because you're always dealing with, you know, compliance versus, you know, are you going to get to a trough? Um, so I, I'd be interested in other people's opinions on that. But this young man, who's my most recent CPVT patient, I'd, I've been following this family for 20 years and have been trying to figure out why two siblings died. Now, the reason, of course, why it was so difficult was because it was 20 years ago and we didn't have much in the way of genetic information or samples. So eventually I followed this family with two sudden deaths um, in, in sibling teenagers and followed all the siblings' children, and finally one of them showed up with, with P PVCs on exercise, and we made the diagnosis, went back, did the RYR2. Um, and this boy, uh, this is a family of, um, um, a, a very obese family throughout many generations, and this boy was actually having lots of success with working out and losing weight, despite this culture in his family of, of you know, food and obesity and just maybe genetics and so on. And, and now the question is, how much can we let him exercise? Because um, I think that, you know, you have to, CPVT, one, th one thing is living, but one thing is living well. In the old times, so I implanted several ICDs and in some of them already reached the uh, adult age. And then I remember they have difficulty with the beta blockers and then many uh, attacks and then we put ICD. Now uh, after flecanides, I am very happy. Uh, none of them had uh, uh, problems with the flecanide and uh, not all together. Uh, the so ICD is sitting there but not working anymore. The problem is uh, in to putting an ICD in a uh, teenager or smaller child creates a very severe psych psychological problems, especially uh, I have several patients with this kind of problems and then they uh, regret uh, to go to school and then to do other things. Uh, actually, uh, another issue to forget the drug, uh, forgetting the drug is another issue, especially with the uh, classical Propanol uh, is a disaster because wh when they forget once time, they can have the attack, maybe they can die. But the newer drugs, maybe more prolonged half time, uh, they need to uh, forget for more than one day, maybe uh, then they will have the uh, attacks. I don't know. But there will be some cases uh, who had the atrial tachycardia to get, uh, with the ventricular arrhythmias. 
they need more special attention, I think. Uh, with, with this, uh, in these kids, uh, they need maybe more ICD together with the new drugs, new therap the therapeutic regimen uh, will, be, will be beneficial, I think. I would like to comment on the black and night dose. You, you asked about dosages. So, so we use like in the smaller kids, three to five milligrams per kilo, and we do it twice a day, BID. And in the older ones, um, I go to up to twice a hundred. This is my, but I would say in an obese um, youngster, I would have no problem on an inpatient um, basis to put him on three times a hundred milligrams of, of black and night. I don't know what what did you do? Uh, what's what's your dosing? Yeah, we, we put him on BID just because of you know issues around compliance, and and um, I think I put him on a hundred BID, mm. but um, I try not to you know, keep going with per mil, you know, per kilogram dosing once we no, get into you have adults to with yeah. obesity. Sure. Yeah. But well, in the smaller kids, I mean. Well, what about exercise? I mean, how much can we let these kids exercise and what kinds of exercise mm. are, are, can they do to maintain, you know, I, mean, it's just I, I would, I personally would say that you can, 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 uh, can do that with regular exercise testing at your center. And as you said, the protocol is maybe also of, of it doesn't make sense to just let them do a little bit, so you have to talk to your exercise people to really, and see what they do. And I would feel confident if, if they have good exercise tests with no ectopy or almost no, I would let them play. And then the other thing nowadays, what I talk to families is, I say, okay, what is worst case? Your, your, your kid is playing and there is, a, there is something. So you have to be sure that an ICD is there. And people are more and more willing, at least in Germany, the sports clubs have ICDs now. There are more and more ICDs around. So I always talk to the family and say, look at the worst case scenario and have a plan. And some even bought their ICDs, I mean, because, so I think it's about the matter of how, how is the setting, but I would allow it. I mean, we, I, sorry? Oh, I mean the uh, automotive, the externally. I think everybody knew, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, we're going to limit to one more question here, and then I, I do have one or two questions already from the audience, and I'm soliciting more in case anybody feels the venture to, uh, to stand up. But we'll let Molly have the last word here. Um, so we talk a lot about exercise uh, uh, permission or restrictions. Um, what about uh, sexual activity? Uh, so I, I had a patient with CPVT die during sexual activity. So I just wanted to hear people's thoughts on that. And so did I. <laughs> I have one that died driving. She always hated this place, this canyon in the West. And she wouldn't, uh, she was on Fleckenite and we found her body by the side of the road. She'd gotten out of the car. Um, and that, I used to put a holter on her and make her drive that with, and to decide, because she never had anything on exercise study, but she had it every time she drove Black Canyon, but unfortunately that's where she died. Was she symptomatic before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She had a sympathetic, uh, she, she refused a sympathetic denervation, but it was on Fleckenite and Natalol. Yeah, sympathetic, uh, very symptomatic. May I ask a question? Yeah, uh, are you routinely using a serum concentration level of flacainite while you are giving your patients? In, I know that in some countries it is not possible to look for serum concentration. To answer Molly's question, I guess I'll, I'll take it on. Um, I mean, I think sex is part of, part of life, right? And I think our goal is to let kids live their life in all the different things that they do with sort of reasonable things. I, I don't know how you get a teenager to not have sex, so that's my other thing. Yeah, people have been working on that for a long time. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> all right, um, let, let me solicit, uh, I, I do have some more channelopathy questions in my phone here. Um, before I get to them, just to, to, are there any other people who would have a venture to stand up and raise another topic? We have about, we probably, at the rate we're going, we have time for one more good, this was a good discussion. John, do you have a? I just one on the, on the topic of post pathways. I had a scary experience with a patient having uh, 
perforation during ablating in the ostium of the coronary sinus without, without much power or temperature rise and without any, any, uh, any uh, steam pop. And actually it happened during tachycardia and the tachycardia kept going on and it was an unsuccessful attempt but the, the pressure completely disappeared and we were lucky that surgeons were standing by and I mean we're next room and, and save the patient but how, how do you make sure that you don't do let something me, let me catast rephrase, catastrophic? Let me rephrase the question more generally for the panel if I may. What are your particular concerns about cardiac injury during ablation, perforation, and other direct cardiac injury? Where do you feel the most nervous, and what aspects of technology or technique are we using now uh, to prevent uh, surgical complications from occurring in the cath lab? Power, we usually start with 20 or 30 in the coronary sign, so don't go very high. And temperature was 55 to 60, but we never had any, any evidence that there was anything. How old the patient and what was the procedure? How old? Yeah. This was a very skinny 11-year-old, very thin, 25 kilograms only. Might, might be that this played a role, but I, I, we wouldn't... We wouldn't predict that this would happen. I mean, it was just out, out of the blue. Uh, the, the surgeons uh, could, could able to find any There was a hole. That? There was a, a, a quite a sizable hole in the... Uh, oh, but there is no weakening of the coronary signs or something no. like that? No, no. Coronary ended up being fine. So to try to address your question, John. Um, I mean, I guess there's a whole bunch. Um, you know, and I think Obviously, the, younger, the smaller the heart, the more likely it is that you're going to potentially have trouble with various things, including perforation. I, I guess my major point would be that you know you're going to have complications. I think tamponade is one of those things that occasionally happens, um, and uh, I think the most important thing about that is to be on the alert for even subtle signs of um, of uh, difficulty. So often, you know, uh, I've been involved in a few of these where essentially the only sign that you see is is sort of a mild tachycardia. Um, and when you're in the middle of a case and you suddenly notice mild tachycardia, you know, you really do have to stop have to stop and ask yourself, okay, why is the patient tachycardia? Sometimes it's just that you swapped out sheaths, and sometimes I, I will put a little local anesthetic in before I swap sheaths just to save myself that level of anxiety, if you know what I mean. Um, but being willing to, you know, grab an echo machine and, and, and look at, at, you know, quickly will keep you out of, out of trouble. Comment, Isabel? I, I think uh, if you look at all the times that we, um, that we put catheters to the CS and then at the few times that we have a perforation, I doubt that you can avoid that. For me, it's like, it's this one in a million person who has uh, an unknown thing that leads to a uh, higher risk of perforation. And I, I remember the first AVNRT uh, that we did together with a younger fellow, and she was nervous and about everything, and uh, she did the case very well, and we the ablated the AVNRT, but then the patient was in tamponade, and she did nothing wrong. Uh, but she hates since then avian T ablation. <laughs> 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 Much more than any AFib ablation. <laughs> but it, it was very traumatic, but I really I had to tell her a thousand times you did nothing wrong and you did nothing different from what I would have done. Uh, it was just that that was the one patient that had this thin wall of the CS. I think you cannot avoid it. And if you look at the numbers, uh, I think it's maybe zero point something percent that get this, and and I, and I doubt that you can avoid it by any mean, because uh, then you prefer it also with, with just the CS catheter. We had that in AFib patients, where we never went to the CS. So. It's about noticing it, as as he said, you you have subtle signs. You have a sedated patient, and we're doing a lot of echoes. If anyone doesn't feel well, the echo machine is there, and and we're looking. Uh, the case, only, the only sign that we had something wrong was the blood pressure, the tachycardia, 
was, it was an SVT, we didn't have any other sign, and that taught me just to put an arterial line on everybody because otherwise we wouldn't know until the patient was, was nearly in cardiac arrest. I mean, the SVT was going on, SATs did not change very much, and, and that just made me, Can you know. I ask, Maybe it's do, a we good think, do we think that the mechanism of perforation is more related to force or it ablation? Could, it could be, and that's another thing that contact force may be just uh, another thing that we should what about all the be all doing. Of the Very, uh, I'm sorry? What about the duration of the energy when you realize that it's perforation? Well, that we, we didn't do very much because tachycardia didn't stop, so we, we, we stopped the lesion like in t 10 seconds or something like that. Frank? Uh, I, I just thought uh, a word of caution for our interventionalists these days are putting in a lot of devices in the outflow track, a lot of valves, and um, I didn't realize that sometimes they put the stent in there and it's not fully seated against the myocardium. And we had a catheter and trap, you know, we were doing a VT ablation and the catheter just went through the strut and it didn't come out. <laughs> and it was not pretty. I mean, it, it had, you had to go to the operating room, but I just, when you see stents in the outflow track, they may not be friendly. <laughs> yes, um, I also want, want to share with you my case, my single case with, uh, with uh, tampon 8 after 1000 ablation. And it was a normal uh, left-sided uh, pathway. Uh, the transeptal puncture was uh, nothing uh, special. And uh, then uh, after one, one and a half or after the transeptal puncture, during ablation, the patient uh, became uh, bradycardic. And uh, the, but the patient was uh, sedated with uh, propofol, as usually. And uh, then it uh, became out that it's a, a tamponade. We had to puncture uh, the, um, the pericardial uh, space. Uh, so there was not enough time uh, for the surgeon. And um, luckily uh, we, we managed it, but uh, um, the patient had a severe um, hypoxia. So we have to cool uh, the patient for 24 hour. Uh, and then, but luckily everything uh, um, recovered. So no uh, sequela, no complication, nothing else. And uh, what I have learned from this case that um, if the patient is sedated, uh, there is not early sign. So in adults, when the patient is not sedated, he feels the pain. And um, he already says that, uh, doctor, I don't feel uh, well. But if, the, if the, this child was sedated, we could, we could not uh, realize it. Even if the anesthesi anesthesiologist uh, was at the, um, at the head and there was an anesthesiologist assistant, but we do not um, uh, perform routinely arterial invasive me measurements. So the solution for us was that uh, from now on, we use ice for every uh, patient when there is a transeptal puncture, even if only for monitoring, because if the patient is sedated, then uh, with ice, we can realize much earlier uh, the, the tamponade. I'm going to say thank you for that, Laszlo. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to thank the 37 discussants this morning. <laughs> this has worked out better than uh, we had imagined. We have a list of another four or five topics. I apologize to the extremely complex channelopathy that emerged on my text message chain that didn't get addressed. But you know there's people here who can answer that question. We have sessions at 9. The session in here is going to be on clinical EP, and uh, there should be an exciting session as well next door on digital health, uh, starting in about three minutes. So off with the day, and thank you all. <laughs>